Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Dishman Carbogen AMSYS Limited Earnings Conference Call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode, and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchtone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Pascal, CEO of Carbogen AMSYS Limited. Thank you and over to you. Thank you, moderator, and uh, good afternoon, uh, dear uh, elders. Uh, welcome to our quarterly call. Happy to be here this afternoon with you and uh, giving you a bit of a, of a <clears throat> of a news about uh, this month's carbogen analysis and particularly carbogen analysis. Uh, on our performance on the, on the, on the third quarter of this fiscal year. This uh, third quarter uh, was a, a kind of a consolidation of all the efforts we, uh, we are uh, initiating uh, in a different part of the group to, uh, to go uh, to the next level. Uh, uh, Paolo is, is going to come back on, on, the, on the big success we had on the, on the EDQM. Uh, it's September and the, the, the latest uh, uh, nice consequences we have, we have on that. Uh, on the carbon side, uh, despite of uh, uh, challenging uh, currency forex uh, issues uh, with a street strength very high, we, uh, we succeed to perform uh, a nice uh, end quarter free uh, results. Uh, in line with uh, with uh, uh, our performance last year and, and the budget this year, so uh, we are very happy with that. It's a bit more a bit more challenging on the, on, on the profitability level uh, because we still varying the, the the difficulties we were having on the beginning of, of the year with the late start of our uh, drug product uh, business uh, in, in in France. Uh, the good news is that now. Uh, End of the third quarter, we finalized the third GMP production on that site, which was validated, released, and uh, delivered to the to, 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 to the customers. So uh, we are now uh, uh, going through a few operational steps with uh, a nice pipeline of uh, of our project there, and uh, we are currently uh, having uh, uh, production planning, which is full. Uh, until the end of uh, of, uh, of the summer, uh, and we have enhanced uh, a large uh, pipeline of quotations with different type of uh, of customer around the world, uh, and uh, we are very confident that uh, uh, next fiscal year we can achieve uh, our targets with uh, with, with that side. Uh, on the drug substance uh, level, with uh, our Swiss, uh, UK, and Chinese operations. We are we are doing uh, pretty well. Uh, we have uh, uh, closed the, the, the quarter with a, uh, a large amount of uh, purchase order for the development crime activities. Uh, as we speak now, uh, we have in hands uh, approximately 150 million species of uh, of, uh, of uh, orders in hands for, for for that part. If you had. Uh, uh, approximately uh, 90 million of, of, of commercial uh, orders in hand for next year. We are in a very, very good position to, uh, to fulfill uh, our targets for next year. So uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very good. Uh, beginning of, uh, of this year, uh, we've also participated to the, to the GP Morgan conferences uh, in San Francisco. Uh, and uh, we got the confirmations that of the uh, two important factors for our business. First of all, globally, the pharma industry, as you all know, uh, is doing very well uh, this beginning of, of this year with a nice performance for, for 23 for most of the big pharma uh, and also uh, uh, mid-size pharma uh, companies in, in the world, which are uh, all our clients. Uh, a large number of uh, deals, big deals like uh, uh, Pfizer acquiring a CGEN, uh, uh, in US, uh, with, uh, with, uh, 43 billion are really pulling the, the market and the investors to, to, to put more money in, in, in the biotech industry, which is giving us uh, a lot of opportunity with new clients, new projects that are coming. 
Uh, as you know, also, uh, ABC business uh, is very trendy, uh, as well as the oncology uh, uh, applications for, for new drugs and new treatments of, of, of cancers. So two areas where uh, the group is, is very strong. So uh, we also very confident uh, for for uh, for the, the, the coming quarters that uh, we are going to harvest the, the fruit of uh, of our strategy of focusing on uh, both oncology and, uh, and ABC business uh, and both uh, carbogenesis and digital carbogenesis side. So all in all, uh, we are very confident with uh, with uh, with our with our future, mid and long term. Uh, despite of uh, of uh, small challenges, and I think. Uh, we are going to come back on that uh, with uh, with uh, profitability due mainly to uh, some of uh, of uh, high uh, exchange rates that are not playing in our favor, uh, being a Swiss franc based affiliate of the group. Uh, I will be happy to answer your questions later on, and I end up the the the, the call to our global CFO Mr. Ashil Dalal. Thank you very much, Pascal. Hello, everybody. A very good afternoon to to all. Um, as far as the financial performance for the for the quarter ended December 31, 2023 is concerned, it was it was a strong quarter for us uh, in terms of the consolidated numbers. Um, as far as the revenue is concerned, we closed at 651 crores on a consolidated basis. As compared to uh, last year, same quarter, which was at about 640 crores, so the growth was about two percent. But on a on a nine months basis, uh, the revenue was 1,961 crores as compared to 1,794 crores, uh, which is a growth of about 9.3 percent. So the year continues to be uh, continues to be strong for us, and we do expect a strong Q4 as well. As far as the, the EBITDA is concerned, excluding a notional forex impact, which was to the tune of about 76 crores in the in the quarter ended December 31, 23, this stood at 119 crores um, as, as compared to 115 crores in the comparable quarter of uh, of FY23. This this notional impact of 76 crores is largely driven by the movement in the US dollar Swiss franc currency pair. Uh, as you are aware, most of our revenues in, in Switzerland are denominated in, in US dollars. Uh, and we also hold a uh, hold balance in the US dollar account, which needs to be restated at the closing exchange rate of the US dollar Swiss franc at the end of the reporting period. Uh, this this uh, forex loss pertains to that particular movement, where the U.S. dollar Swiss franc, as of 30th of September 23, uh, stood at 0 0.9156, uh, which as of 31st December 23 stood at 0.8417. So there is there was a movement of almost uh, 750 pips uh, in that particular currency pair. And uh, the balance that was in the U.S. dollar account was to the tune of about 120 million. So, so there was uh, that notional impact on the on the bank account balance. Uh, part of that notional impact is already reversed in the in the current quarter because uh, the U.S. dollar Swiss franc is uh, is again back up to around 0 0.8850. Uh, but since the reporting of the Swiss entity takes place in Swiss franc. Uh, we had to uh, account for this translation loss on account of the forex movement. So the right way to look at our numbers would be to uh, to ignore this uh, notional impact uh, for calculation of the EBITDA and the and the, and the other financial parameters. So the EBITDA stood at about 119 crores for the quarter, and um, uh, this translated into a strong nine months uh, EBITDA which was uh, to the tune of 309 crores as compared to 287 crores in the nine months of FY23. Um, as far as our, um, our, our segment wise performance is concerned, uh, Carbogenesis grants uh, continue to show a good growth. 
So we saw a growth of about 9.4% in the quarter as compared to Q3 of FY23. Uh, in absolute numbers, the revenue stood at 506 crores as compared to 462 crores in the comparable quarter. And this translated into a 19% growth in the first nine months of the financial year, uh, where the revenue stood at 1,504 crores as compared to 1,264 crores in the comparable nine months of the previous financial year. As far as our vitamin D uh, analogs and cholesterol business is concerned, we saw a dip in the revenue in the current quarter. Uh, so the revenue stood at about 61 crores as compared to 82 and a half crores in the comparable quarter of FY23. However, uh, in the, the, the first half for, for the cholesterol and vitamin D and logs business in terms of revenue was quite strong, and hence for the nine months, uh, the, the revenue growth is at 14.6%. The lower revenue in the current quarter is largely on account of lower sales of cholesterol SF, uh, which was kind of a conscious decision because of the increasing prices or the increased prices of uh, of one of the key raw materials, which is the wool grease, uh, which we are expecting should come down in the in the in the coming quarters. As far as the uh, India cramps business is concerned, uh, the revenue stood at about 55.6 crores, as compared to 46 crores in the comparable quarter last year, which is a growth of about 21%. Um, and uh, as, as we had mentioned in the previous call as well, uh, we do expect that the India cramps business should should uh, generate a growth in the second half of the year, and uh, the increase in revenue in Q3 of FY24 is in line with uh, our expectations, and we expect the Q4 should be even much stronger than what we saw in Q3 as far as the India cramps business is concerned. The India Quartz and generic business, which is largely the business that we do off our, out of our Naroda facility, uh, we saw a dip in that particular business, uh, largely on account of uh, of a slowdown in the in the chemical sector, because what we manufacture are largely the quaternary compounds, um, uh, the, the the PTCs as well as certain generic KPIs. So we do expect that uh, we should start seeing a ramp up in that particular business. Uh, starting from Q4 and going into the next financial year. So overall, uh, the quarter, as I mentioned earlier, we ended with 651 crores of revenue. On a nine-month basis, it was 1,961 crores. As far as the margins are concerned, uh, Carbogenamsis cramps business uh, at an EBITDA level, excluding the, the forex, the notional forex impact, uh, did an impressive margin of uh, close to 20% uh, for the quarter, and for the nine months, this stood at about 18.3%, uh, very much in line with what we did for the first nine months in FY23. Um, in Q3 of FY23, Carbogen Amsis uh, uh, Cram's business had a large amount of commercial supply, and especially phase three supply, because of which the EBITDA margin was exceptionally high at about 22.3%. <clears throat> the cholesterol and vitamin D business um, did a EBITDA margin of 16.6%, which is very much in line with Q3 of FY23, where it did about 17%. And for the nine months, it stood at about 15% as compared to 18% for the nine months of FY23 largely on account of uh, the, the increase in the wool grease prices uh, that we saw over the last 12 months. The India business on the cram side did an, did an EBITDA of about 11%, while the India quartz and generic business did an EBITDA of about 7.5%. Uh, so we do expect, uh, you know, now with the, with the clearances from two major regulatory agencies having been received, including the official certificates in January, um, from Japanese PMDA and uh, the EDQM, respectively, we do expect uh, the India business to, to come back on track as far as the cramps business is concerned. So these were uh, more or less the financial highlights for the quarter and the nine months ended December 31, 23. Uh, the net debt as of 31st December stood at about 158 million, which is about two and a half million less than what we had reported in the last quarter. 
and the capital expenditure for the first nine months was at about 25 million. Uh, we do, we expect that it should it should be closer to 30 million by the end of the financial year. Uh, having said that, I would like to hand over the call to Mr. Sanjay Machmidar, our independent director, to say some few words. Thank you very much. Thank you, Harshil, and uh, good after very good afternoon to all. So, as Harshil explained, uh, two, three major highlights, and as Pascal also highlighted, one, the France facility, whatever initial teething troubles have been there, I think they are about to be solved or they are mostly resolved, and that should see. France starting to contribute in a regular manner, definitely a little bit from Q4 of this year and uh, uh, much better on an overall basis in the next fiscal. Similarly, India, after the EDQM and the Japanese authorities have given official clearance, Indian cramps will also see a very handsome growth. Um, uh, uh, the the, the co-investment project progress is also quite good. Lot of developments are happening, so I'm I'm reasonably confident uh, that next fiscal should be one of the uh, real regular steady fiscal with a significant top line growth as compared to the current fiscal because of all these favorable factors. At least in a higher mid to higher teens is what we are expecting, and a very considerably strong EBITDA growth with the normalization uh, expected in almost all quarters. Historically, because of a very long period of time, we have been facing difficulties. We are sounding cautiously optimistic, and internal level of confidence is quite high. So I think with this, uh, Herschel, I, we can uh, uh, hope for a very good next fiscal year, and we can open the call uh, for the Q&A. Or do you want, uh, 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 Harshil, do we uh, have anything else to say? Or you want the call to be open for q and I think we'll just uh, hand over the call to uh, Paolo, Paolo to yeah. give an update on the on the India side, and then we can open the floor for Q&A. Yeah. Please, over so to you, Paolo. Yeah, yeah thank you, Harshil. Uh, so good afternoon to all the shareholders. Uh, uh, I'm would like to give a few words more regarding the uh, compliance uh, GMP uh, at the site. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we received the final approval from the Japanese authorities, PMDA, on 23rd January 2024, and uh, this is related to the uh, audit held on 31st July till 3rd of August. Uh, we received uh, after that, just after uh, 10 days, about one week, uh, the final certification from the DQM and IFA, Italian Medicine Agency, at the end of January. Uh, the UGB compliance certificate, which was uh, uh, the certification and, uh, awaited, was uploaded by IFA to the AODA GMDP website on 2nd February, which is less than two weeks ago. Uh, this is, is the positive end of a very long journey. And uh, I want to remember that Dishman Carbogenanzi applied for an EDQM inspection on uh, 18 October 2022, but the audit took place only on 18 to 20 September 2023, and the final approval was just received two weeks ago on 2 February 2024. So a long, uh, a long period. Uh, this news uh, has generated a lot of enthusiasm among our customers who were uh, eagerly awaiting for the and final result. Uh, since the last week, two weeks, uh, we have been able to restart all the discussion with the customer regarding the old uh, a, a new project. Uh, needless to say that uh, that is a great achievement uh, for for, uh, for the company and for the group uh, uh, overall. Uh, I'm going to take the call to uh, our global CFO, Arshin Dalan. Thank you, Paolo, for the update. So, moderator, I think we can open the floor for Q&A now. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and 1 on their touchdown telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and 2. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles.
We have a first question from the line of Nitin Dharmavat from Oram Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, couple of questions. Uh, uh, so, what is the revenue we are targeting from the French facility in the next financial year, considering the delays that we had? Pascal, do you want to take that, or should I answer that? Yeah, I can. I, I, I can. I can take that for uh, for this for this uh, quarter and uh, with the start uh, the, the restart of the revenue, knowing that we we are generating revenues from the, from the development activities, but not from the from the operation line activities, but where we have delays. We are uh, aiming for uh, this uh, quarter and. Uh, between seven and eight billion of uh, of, uh, of euros uh, revenues from uh, from uh, from this uh, from this quarter. Okay. Uh, the cost of materials consumed has gone up significantly. So what is the reason for this? Is it going to be in a similar way in the subsequent quarter and next financial year, or are we uh, are we seeing any moderation in in cost of material? Yeah. So, uh, so the cost of goods sold for us, you know, on an average remains at roughly about uh, 20%. So I think more or less for the year we should be closing at that. So the only the only place you know where we have seen a significant increase in the raw material price, you know, as I mentioned uh, in my in my uh, remarks, is in Netherlands, where the prices of the wool grease, which is one of the key raw materials. You know that that price has gone up uh, significantly over the last uh, 12 months or so. So we are expecting that that should normalize, you know, over the next quarter. Uh, but apart from that, the cost should remain at roughly around uh, 20 percent. I see. Uh, so uh, in one of the remarks uh, by the driven director, he has mentioned about, you know significant growth possibilities in EBITDA and sales in next financial year that uh, the company has been talking about in the previous count call also. So what makes you confident that uh, we'll be able to achieve this growth? And we see uh, so many positive changes. So what has changed from the current quarter, current financial year, uh, which is going to result in this in the next uh, financial year? So I think, uh, you know, there are uh, two or three triggers uh, that, that we can mention here. You know, one is uh, is the French facility, you know, where uh, we have already done the CapEx. The CapEx, I mean, the, the plant is already ready. We are now producing from that particular plant. So we will have the first full financial year of production and sales from the French facility. So that will be an accretion to the revenue as well as to uh, to the EBITDA and eventually to the PAT. So this year, uh, you know, with seven to eight million of uh, of revenue that the French entity would be generating, you know, we, we would still be generating an EBITDA loss, uh, which would be say to the tune of about uh, five and a half to six million. So next year, you know, we do expect that uh, we should be breaking even and even uh, turning into profit. Uh, depending upon the revenues that, uh, you know, uh, I mean, achievement of the revenues that we have projected for the next financial year. So th this is number one. Number two is that, uh, you know, as, as uh, you know, we had mentioned earlier, we have entered into uh, this agreement for, um, for an ADC molecule with a large Japanese innovator. And the expansion that we have done for, for ADC in Switzerland, that is also now qualified. And we should start seeing the the revenues coming, the production and the revenues coming out of that particular expansion again in the next financial year and going forward. So again, you know that would be the first financial year for uh, for, for the production and sales coming out of uh, the expansion that we have done uh, in Switzerland. And number three is uh, is obviously one of the key factors, you know, that everybody was looking forward to was the was the regulatory clearance. For uh, for the Babla side, especially from the EDQM and the IFA. So now, since that certificate is already in place, it it would allow us to um, to secure more business from the European region, which is the largest market for us as far as India is concerned. 
So in terms of the APIs, we would be able to uh, procure more orders, one from the existing customers, number two, uh, even from the new customers, and we are also looking at possibilities how we could closely collaborate with our, I mean, we can have a close collaboration between the Swiss entity and the Indian entity in order to transfer some of the products to India. So with all of this, uh, you know, we do believe that it should have a positive impact both on the revenues as well as on the operating margins for the group as a whole. I understand. So there is, uh, uh, looks like a lot of dependency on the euro uh, that we are talking about for the growth. Uh, in the previous quarter, you talked about high, high inflation rates and energy costs, especially in euro. So how is the situation on that front right now? So, uh, you know, we, ha we are seeing the energy prices uh, coming down from, you know, what they were about a year and a half back uh, when the war had broken out between Russia and Ukraine. So, for now close to two years. So, we are seeing uh, the prices coming down. Those, you know, those haven't come down to what we had seen uh, prior to the war. But yeah, I mean, we do expect that that should normalize or that should um, uh, that should be at the current level for the next uh, 12 months and going forward. So that is number one. As far as inflation is concerned, yes, I mean, right now it does. I mean, it is high, uh, but uh, you know, now we are seeing uh, based upon the data that is being published and what uh, the Fed is talking about, what um, you know the. Uh, the, the finance regulators of the other countries are talking about, we do expect that the interest rate should start coming down during the course of the next uh, two to three quarters. So that should help in, in improving the inflation scenario, uh, which should also help us in the overall cost uh, that we are able to manage out of, uh, out of our European entities. Having said that, uh, you know, what we are also trying to do, and it's a continuous process, is to pass on this cost, I mean, not it won't be like a one-to-one -one immediate transfer, but uh, you know we have been successful, and we would be pursuing our customers in order to transfer part of this increased cost uh, to our customers, which will which will start showing up in the in the selling prices that we charge to our customers. So we are working on both the fronts: one on the cost control, secondly also on increasing the selling prices wherever possible. And also, uh, from that perspective, it, also, it was also quite critical for us to get the regulatory clearances in India so that we can always evaluate India as a destination where we could do the larger scale manufacturing. And that is the place, you know, where we can actually bring in larger amount of cost efficiencies. So, so all said and done, you know, we, we are trying to work on both the paths, on the cost control as well as increasing the selling prices. So what is generally the lag time between, you know, uh, uh, price, raw material price has gone up and the price which are passed on to the customer, what is generally the lag time? One quarter, two quarter, three quarter? So it depends upon uh, customer to customer and uh, the length of the contract that we have with the customer plus the relationship that we carry. So I would say, you know, it could range anywhere between uh, two quarters going up to four quarters. And, and again, having said that, if there is a contract which comes up for renewal, you know, that, that obviously opens up the possibility to renegotiate the contract. But I would say, um, on an average, it would be on an annual basis. But Pascal, uh, you know, uh, if you want, if you have something else to add, please do. No, oh, yeah, you have such right on the, on the, on this, uh, Increase of of, of of pricing. Uh, uh, there's always uh, a bit of a, of, a, of a lag between the time then uh, uh, we can transfer those, uh, those those increase in cost to customer due to the the sequence uh, of uh, opening the negotiations with, with those customer. And as you can imagine, uh, in front of us we have a, a pretty big company with a, a pretty big uh, purchasing power, so we really have to, to, to push hard and to negotiate hard on, on those things. But uh, little by little, we, uh, we are successful on all our contracts to, to, to pass it by. What we are facing is, uh, over the last few quarters, the inflation was, was kind of going, and, uh, and uh, once you start to negotiate one new, new pricing, and this, uh, this pricing is coming into play, and you face another uh, uh, level of, of increase. So we are, 
we were, I would say, in, in that kind of a race where we all will have to come back to the to the to the customers to pass by a new uh, price increase. Uh, what we can tell from now is we see uh, a decrease of of uh, of this inflation rate. It's not terminated. Uh, from time to time, we see some 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 uh, some slight increase, but. This curve is is, is 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 decreasing definitely, so that's the good news, uh, and that means uh, we are going to end up that phase of of uh, ongoing uh, discussion negotiation of new pricing, and at some point we should cope with uh, our new pricing, our new cost, and and uh, we should come back to a uh, to a proper profitability level. That that that's very true. So, uh, uh, but we we uh, we don't leave anything on the table, and we really push out all the customers. Uh, wherever we uh, we have the opportunity to to, to pass this uh, this cost increase, uh, this is ex- extremely important for us. So I think just to add, uh, Hershel and Pascal, uh, while yes, it's true that we are dependent on Europe, the fact is that we are in a very niche kind of the pharma broad categorization, and um, we're still seeing an extremely strong pipeline for the new orders at Carbogen MC's level and at EBITDA's of about 20% adjusted uh, to that one-off. I think overall our situation is relatively less impacted as compared to maybe a general chemical or a agrochemical kind of sectors. Absolutely, Sanjeev, you're absolutely right on, on, on that point. Uh, uh, as I was mentioning at Carbogen right now with uh, with these uh, uh, crumbs uh, uh, development activities, with a uh, uh, current pipeline at uh, 150 million species in total, uh, we face a, 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 an historical high level of uh, of, uh, of of purchase order uh, for for the cabbage and MC entity. So uh, that's important to say. If you look only uh, two years back, we have a uh, same period of time. Uh, 90 to 100 million, so that that's a 50 percent increase in two years in this in this uh, in this order end pipeline. So it demonstrates how uh, uh, confident our customers are to place uh, orders and, and long-term orders with uh, with our business. Definitely. This question has been answered. We'll take the next question from the line of Nirvana Laha from Badrinath Family Office. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for the opportunity. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Please go yes. ahead. Yeah, yeah thanks. So uh, this is my first time on this call, so I'll take you back a little bit in history, so uh, pardon me for that. So uh, in your history as Dishman Pharma, over 10 years, I think the company made something like 10 to 12% return on capital. and about 10 to 12 percent return on equity. If you compare with other CRAMs or API players with uh, plants uh, abroad or in India, this is probably on the lower side. Since the merger in 2017, our ROCs, uh, even when we were doing 25, 26 percent EBITDA margins, our ROCs were at 5 to 6 percent. And since we have started the CapEx and since the Russian, the Russia-Ukraine war has started, it's almost no returns on capital. So can you help me understand as a person who's evaluating this company with fresh eyes, you know, what has led to this uh, subpar performance on capital allocation? And today, what is the board's expectations of return on capital or return on equity going forward in the next uh, one to three years? So, uh, th- thank you, uh, Nirmana, for your question. So, uh, you know, as far as the return on capital employed is concerned, uh, if you look at our balance sheet, uh, basically, you know, there is one a large amount of goodwill which sits on our balance sheet, which uh, which arose largely on account of uh, of the merger that we had undertaken in 2017. So it was, it was a merger between the group entities, but the advantage that it gave us was to bring on the balance sheet, the intangible assets that lied within the company. And uh, so that was part of it, and part of it is the goodwill on consolidation. So, you know, when you look at the ROC, the right way would be to discount that goodwill 
uh, when, when you take the, the 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 capital employed, because you know there is actually no cash which is going out for for the creation of that particular goodwill. So that is number one. Number two, as far as our uh, fixed assets are concerned, you know most of our fixed assets are located uh, in geographies outside of India. So those fixed assets get restated at the closing exchange rate, and so does the goodwill get restated at the closing exchange rate at the end of every reporting period. So if you take 31st March, you know, that gets restated at the closing exchange rate. So uh, we had done a calculation, I think about a year back. So the impact which is embedded in the fixed assets just on account of Forex, you know, that was, uh, that stood at about 600 crores. And today that impact would be even higher. So even that needs to be uh, discounted when you take the capital employed. Uh, if, if you take this out, you know, the return on the capital employed, you know, especially, uh, I mean, obviously the last three, three and a half years, uh, we were impacted adversely because of the, of the uh, regulatory issues in, in one of our largest manufacturing plants. But uh, apart from that, if you take like financial year 2020 or 2019, our ROC came to roughly about uh, 15 to 16%. Our internal target is to move towards 20-25% uh, in the in the medium term, and you know get towards the 30% mark in the long term. But that is something which needs to be taken into account, you know, when you calculate the ROC ratios, because that would be the right way to look at it. And you know, if you're considering the debt, the right way to look at the debt would again be in foreign currency rather in INR, because there is a mark-to-market impact which keeps on happening on that. Okay, thanks. That was very helpful. So, in terms of your sure. growth, in terms of revenue growth, uh, will you be in a position to uh, tell us what kind of growth you're looking for from FY25 to FY26? And how would that look like segmentally? So, I'm not looking at exact numbers or anything, but in terms of percentages, if you've already been able to project something, how does the overall growth look like for the next uh, one, two, three years? And segmentally, like India and Europe crams and the generics and the vitamin D business, how would, uh, which would contribute how much to the growth? So, uh, you know, if you take a three to five year view, you know, we would, uh, we would want to grow and, you know, based upon what we have planned internally, we should be growing at a CAGR of close to about 15% on a, on a consolidated basis. The major drivers of this would be one, definitely India. Because now with the, with the kind of, um, you know, the changes that have been brought in by, uh, by Paolo and the team on the operational side, both at Babla as well as Naroda, we believe that India, uh, India now has the, has the capacity and the capability to do a revenue of close to about 1000 crores, uh, without any major capex. So that is the capability, you know, which has already been built as far as the India size is concerned, and it will be one of the key growth drivers, both in terms of revenues as well as in terms of the profitability. As far as uh, the Swiss entity is concerned, you know, that has been growing year over year, and we do expect that it should be, it should keep on growing at anywhere between uh, nine to ten percent, uh, you know, if, if you take a five-year view. So that, that is, as far as the Swiss entity is concerned, as far as the margins are concerned, you know, we should be somewhere around 20 to 22 percent because, you know, it would be very difficult to, to increase the margins exponentially in the Swiss entity, largely because of the, of the cost, especially of the employees that needs to be incurred in order to get more and more development projects. Uh, as far as the Dutch entity is concerned, you know, we, we do expect a, a good amount of ramp up in the, in the vitamin D analogs business. And that is the most profitable business for us as far as the Dutch entity is concerned. Yes, I mean, right now we have, uh, certain pricing issues in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, of our raw materials. But on, on a five year view, you know, we do expect that that business should keep on growing at somewhere around, uh, 10 to 12 percent. As far as uh, the French entity is concerned, you know, that's a completely new revenue stream for us, and that would keep on growing exponentially over the next uh, three to five years' time. And uh, at its peak, it can do a revenue of anywhere between, uh, say, 40, 45 million. Um, and so, so that will be all incremental revenue which will be coming in over the next three to five years' time. 
uh, Shanghai, Manchester, you know, those keep on supporting the other business entities in terms of the intermediates uh, and the key starting materials that we manufacture. So, um, you know, that, that will be kind of an integral part of the Swiss entity, Indian entity, and the French entity. So this, this will be more or less, you know, how we should be looking at the business, where we would see a high amount of uh, double-digit growth as far as India is concerned and close to about 10 to 12 percent as far as the other entities are concerned. Got it. And on the Indian entity, one, I think right now the run rate on uh, cramps is about 200 plus. So as you scale up towards 1,000, how will the EBITDA margin trajectory look like? I think it's right now around 11 percent. Yeah, so uh, if you see historically, the India cramps business has, had been doing close to about 40 percent kind of EBITDA margin. So we do expect that, uh, you know, it should be able to reach those kind of uh, EBITDA margins on the cram side of the, of, you know, cram side of the business. Uh, as far as our quartz intermediates, PTCs uh, business is concerned, which we do out of Naroda, we should be able to generate close to about 25% uh, kind of EBITDA margin. So that, that would be, you know, kind of the right way to look at it. Okay, got it. And a couple more questions. So one on CapEx. So... I think last call you said that most of your CapEx, once the CWIT is commercialized, your CapEx only becomes maintenance CapEx from next year. So is that right? And how much uh, would that CapEx run rate uh, be and for how many years? So our maintenance CapEx is close to about uh, 16 to 17 million, all entities put together. So that is something that we will keep on incurring uh, year over year. As far as the growth capex is concerned, yes, I mean there will be certain amount of capex. Uh, I would say not significant, but only if it is driven by certain customer projects. You know, like for example, we had this ADC molecule. You know, where we entered into a co-investment agreement with the customer, and there could be a possibility in the future as well. So where it is completely driven by increased offtake agreements that we enter into with the customers. Uh, apart from that, you know, we don't expect any any major uh, capex to happen over the next, uh, at least for the next three years. Uh, the only other area, you know, where we are incurring, uh, so to say, a capital expenditure is on the digital transformation initiative uh, that we are undertaking across all of the carbogenesis entities. And you know, we are we are trying to integrate the organization as much as possible as far as the systems, the processes are concerned. Got it. And uh, if I had to model your depreciation, uh, I understand CWIP is yet to come in. So how would you suggest that we try to project your depreciation in the coming coming years? Is there a percentage to revenue or something like that we could look at? So I think, uh, you know, more or less we can take the depreciation, you know, that you see in uh, Q3 as, uh, as more or less the depreciation that you will see in the future uh, because, you know, the French assets are – you know, are already, so to say, put to use. So we are already accounting for the depreciation uh, in starting from Q3 of, uh, of FY24. Very nice. And last question from my side. You have about 1,000 crores of uh, long-term debt. So uh, what will be the kind of deleveraging plan for this uh, in the next three years? And uh, what kind of free cash flow to equity are you looking to generate from FY25? So as far as the long-term debt is concerned, you know, if you see most of that accretion had happened over the last uh, two, two and a half years, largely because of the of the new facility in France, uh, the EDC expansion, certain lab expansion in Switzerland, and for the CapEx that we had done in India. So we do expect that with no major CapEx plans over the next uh, three years or so, um, you know, wh wh whatever cash generation happens from the group, it should help us in reducing the net debt at a group level. And, you know, again, uh, while we might not uh, prepay some of this debt, uh, on a net debt basis is what we will keep on seeing a good amount of deleveraging that should that should happen over the next three years' time. Okay. Uh, thanks, Arshil, for answering, and all the best to you. Sure. Thank you very much, Nirvan. Thank you. We have a next question from the line of Kano Garg from Garg Advisors. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Am I audible? Yes, Hello? please go ahead. Yeah. So I have one question. My first question is, uh, if I look at the number of commercialized molecules, I think they have increased by two in this quarter, and I think one, there has been one increase in 
number of late phase 3 molecules just trying to understand like what should be the potential of these uh, revenue potential of these commercialized molecules and they are in with which therapy uh pascal you want to take that yeah it's it's, it's so if, if i had the answer uh, to that to that particular question a precise answer that, that would be uh, fantastic but uh, you know we are speaking here of a, of, a, of a moving target because the all the, all those projects in phase 3 the revenue that that are potentially generating uh, those molecules at, at commercial level depends on the market authorization which is not in our hands because it's not our molecule it's the ip belonging to our customers so it's uh, it's uh, it's an average we can tell and uh, and you can be completely wrong because you have an assumption that this molecule could be a good fit for the market and then they they, they don't get through uh, the, the, the market authorization. What, what we can tell from uh, from uh, from from an historical data point of view is uh, we used to have a bunch of molecules, one, two, three molecules that are going through this. Uh, uh, commercial uh, uh, bridge from the from the phase three to commercial, so that's going to be to be the same. Now, uh, is it going to be a success for our customer? Are they going to uh, reach their own uh, marketing target? Uh, what we have what we have seen so far is a, a lot of of, uh, of the forecast they were providing were not at the level they they, they were thinking at the very beginning. Or at least they were just 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 below the, the, the standard. So it's very difficult to to uh, to pull something uh, out of that and, and and tell you something that is going to be to, to be real. Uh, I'd like to, I'd love to, because that will uh, make our life much more simpler. But it's almost impossible to predict a number. Uh, what we can tell is what uh, Ashil has, has has mentioned in terms of. of uh, of global growth, that's what we are what we are aiming, and that's what we are trying to achieve with uh, 15 percent growth uh, over a few years. That that's exactly what we are looking at. I'm going to be more than happy to do better uh, if uh, we we got a, a more successful molecule in the pipeline. One thing is sure uh, is from the one that recently moved to the, to, to this position of commercial, and I'm thinking of this. Uh, uh, specific ABC business that we have with this uh, Japanese partner. We have an uh, extremely uh, strong forecast and, and, the, and the, the, the return on, the, on, the, on the, the clinical trials is extremely positive from, uh, from the oncology uh, uh, community. So we are confident that we can reach this minimum 15%. This is, this is crystal clear. Beyond that, very, very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to give you a number. Uh, and if I'm giving something, I, I will be completely wrong, honestly speaking. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. My second question is, sir, uh, I think in the previous call, uh, firstly, like, congratulations on clearing the uh, regulatory inspection. I think in the previous call, we were mentioning that there is a pretty strong order inquiries, and I think customers are waiting for uh, this inspection to happen. I think we were saying that from this uh, site, after the clearance, we can make some 400 to 450 crore revenues in the next year <clears> because in the last three, four years, the inventory has been exhausted. So I think the, the growth expectations, at least for the FY25, I mean, I think in the opening remarks, you said it will be mid teen to high teen. I think the numbers will be significantly higher, right? I mean, 400 to 450 edition from Bavla, then I think the French facility has gone online. Then Dishman, again, like you said, the EDC molecule has come into picture. That will also come into commercial production. So, I mean, why are we giving that, you know, 15 to 20 percent kind of revenue? Because it seems that the growth will be much higher, at least for the next year. Uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, it's, it's always better to... Uh, yeah, be conservative. You, know, you know, in the past, the history has taught us that it always pays to be conservative. Let us achieve it, and we will talk about it. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. These are my two questions. Yeah. Thank you. We have a next question from the line of Kumar Saura from Scientific Investing. Please go ahead. Uh, hello, sir. So, <clears throat> I'm a new investor. One question I have is uh, the amount of volatility I see in the Forex-related losses and all is very high, and uh, I have very layman understanding. So, why can't we hedge it and make it more stable? Uh, that is my question number one. Uh, question number two is I have gone through last uh, three years of all the Concord transcripts 
And uh, if I look at the projections, uh, I think in one of the com calls, it is said that the minimum expected top line growth rate is 12 to 15 percent once we get the right approval, which uh, in congratulations we have got it. And the EBITDA growth rate should be higher. There is one more con call discussion where it is said that by FY26, we will reach almost 24, 25 percent kind of EBITDA margin. And the current EBITDA margin is almost 14 percent. So if we take a 15 to 20 percent EBITDA growth rate from 14 percent EBITDA margin in next two to three years, and also we are seeing that we will reach 25 percent EBITDA margin somewhere. I think the numbers don't match. So I have these two questions. If you can, you know, provide more insights. Sure, uh, sure, Saurabh. So um, the, the first question related to the forex movement. So yes, I mean we have a prudent hedging policy already in place. So all of the all of the revenues, all of the costs, you know, which are in different currencies than the revenues, the liabilities, uh, you know, we 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 have a proper hedging in place in terms of the forward contracts that we enter into. We also enter into swaps in order to hedge the currencies. But the 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 notional forex loss, you know, which which is on account of just translating the balance sheet from one currency to another currency you know obviously and that is because you know every all the reporting has to happen in INR and similarly for the Swiss entity the reporting has to happen in Swiss francs so now whatever balance is available and in Switzerland you know it is possible to keep separate bank accounts in different currencies which obviously in India is not possible so over there you know we have like a dollar account a euro account a GBP account and then a Swiss franc account so whatever is the balance which is remaining as of a particular cutoff date. So say for example, if a customer has given us an advance on say the 29th of December uh, in US dollars, that balance sits in the US dollar account and on 31st of December, I will have to restate that balance at whatever is the, is the closing exchange rate. Similarly, if there is balance which is outstanding on 30th of September, the same gets restated. So because of the significant adverse movement that we saw in the last quarter, uh, you know, we will have to account for a mark to market impact on that balance, on that cash balance, which is available with us in, in, an, in an account or in a currency which is different from the reporting currency. And the same thing happens, you know, in India because all the reporting is in INR, uh, while most of our balances, most of our loans are all in foreign currencies. So yes, I mean, there will always be a notional impact, but the important thing for us to protect is the realized foreign exchange loss. So if you see uh, over a period of time, there has never been a realized foreign exchange loss on, on, the, on the liability side or on the asset side because of the prudent hedging mechanism that we have in place, and that is what we try to protect. So that is, that is the answer to question number one. Uh, if you have any further question on that, please let me know. Otherwise, I'll just move to the next one. Yeah, sir, please go ahead. So the second, yeah, so, the, uh, so as far as the second question is concerned, in terms of the growth in revenue and the EBITDA, so what we said is that, yes, you know, we do expect a growth in the revenue of close to about 12 to 15 percent, and that is a similar guidance that we're giving right now that we expect a CAGR of close to about 15% if, if you take a three to five year view. What we said is that the EBITDA growth would be much higher than this 12 to 15%. And uh, you are absolutely right that uh, our target is to move to 24, 25% of EBITDA at a consolidated level because that is the kind of EBITDA margin that we were already doing if you take the financial year 2020 or maybe even 2019. So, uh, you know, the, the point that we want to make is that we want to move back to those kind of margins. At that point, you know, pre-EDQM, our target was to move to 30%, uh, which obviously was not possible because of the EDQM overhang. But now that that is gone, uh, our minimum expectation would be to move to uh, the levels, you know, what we were, uh, the levels that we were at prior to the EDQM uh, observations. So a 24, 25% kind of EBITDA margin is something which should be achievable, and uh, that is what we target over the next uh, two to three years' time. And, and, and you know, I have already mentioned about the key factors that would drive that. And, uh, you know, as of now, we don't see any major challenges in order to achieve that. 
But just to you know uh, caution you and just to hasten to clarify, the next year's uh, projected target is around 20% because of the fact that we are still in the transition and we are in the first full year of the new facilities where you know it is not the optimum level of operations neither at the France facility nor uh, in the co-investment project that has been just recently commissioned. So the 20% is what is internally targeted for 24-25 and as Harshil explained we should uh, see a gradual improvement, but we will talk about it as we start achieving the numbers that we are currently giving as a guidance. Uh, and so this 40% number we used to do 4-5 years back and uh, surely market has changed in the last 4-5 years, more competition would have come. So what gives us confidence that that old margins are still valid? Like, did we have conversation with the client and we have enough confidence that no client will be able to serve on the same margins? Sorry, I didn't get you. Did you say 40? Uh, the yeah, 40 think, uh, the Sanjay, he's, he's, he's talking about the, about the Bavla Bavla side. He's talking yeah, about the India cramp. Yeah, so, uh, so Saurabh, uh, you are absolutely right. So for us, you know, yes, the cost base has increased because of the increased compliances that we have put in place, uh, both at the Babla site and the Naroda site. So yes, the cost base has increased from what it was, uh, you know, three and a half, four years back. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, it is not so much so because of the competition, uh, but largely because of the increase in the cost base that we, we were compelled to and we have also increased the selling prices for many of our customers and that is again an ongoing process as far as the India business is concerned as well. So we are trying to pass on that increased cost to our customers to the extent possible and uh, that will help us to reach the the close to 40% kind of EBITDA margin uh, over the next uh, two, two years time, two to three years time. Okay. And sir, last question, which is more extension of Nirvana's question. So we discussed about the maintenance capex. Uh, we have some clarity about the growth and margin. So my sense is our cash flow from operation should go back to, uh, you know, 300 crore plus in next one year and maybe 350, 400 crore in next two years. Correct me if I'm wrong. And given we have this maintenance capex and then we have a, a debt, uh, which is around uh, almost uh, total debt around 2,300 crore. So if we can go two, three, four years down the line, how do you see this debt reducing? Like, will we go from 2,300 to, uh, will we maintain it or will there be a significant deduction or like 1,500? Do we have some internal targets to achieve to make the balance sheet stronger? Especially given on the PNL, we almost in occur almost 100 crore of interest. So if we are able to reduce the debt and save that interest, then of course it helps to improve our profitability. Right, you're, you're absolutely right on that. So as far as the uh, the debt is concerned, uh, you know, the right way to look at it would be the, the net debt number and that too in foreign currency because we hardly have any debt which is denominated in INR. And uh, unfortunately, since all of the reporting happens in INR, there is a huge uh, mark-to-market impact on the on the debt figure, and that is the reason in our presentation we mentioned the uh, the, the Swiss franc denominated debt, net debt, which is right now at about 158 million. Uh, what the plan is that as we keep on generating the free cash flow over the next uh, over the next years, we we would keep on seeing the net debt coming down with no major capex plan that we have in sight. So yeah, I mean we would want to get back to close to about uh, 100 million or uh, 100 million Swiss franc of debt, 100 to 110 million o over the next uh, three to four years time. So that that's the that's the target. Okay, so that means our interest cost should come down from 115 crore to somewhere around 60, 65 crore in three to four years. Yes, so so there are two factors in the interest cost. One is obviously the increase in the debt, but more importantly the in increase in the interest cost. So you know, as as you would already know, you know the uh, because of the high inflation um, in US, Europe, also in India, you know the interest rates uh, across the board have gone up significantly. So, like for example, the USD LIBOR, which which went all the way down to zero, is currently at about five and a half percent. Same is the case with Swiss franc, Euribor, as well as um, the, the 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 pound LIBOR. 
So, you know, we would also see uh, an impact because of the reduction in these interest rates over the next uh, 12 months and going into the future. So, one, that will help us in reducing the interest outflow. And the second is obviously the, the decrease in the, in the net debt. Uh, thank you, sir. And sir, one last question. So, uh, we have spent a lot of money and uh, finally uh, we have got clearances both from, you know, Japanese and European authorities. And just, uh, you know, as a la layman, if you can explain what went wrong that time and through all this investment, what have we corrected so that in future for, let's say, in the next three, four years, uh, we should not expect any kind of regulatory hurdle and the next journey is going to be smooth, if you can explain in a very layman manner. Sure. Uh, Paolo, you want to take that? Uh, I didn't hear actually properly. I was breaking the voice, so I did not hear it. So he was, I think he was asking what exactly went wrong, why we got this negative uh, remarks from EDQM, and what are the key corrections that we have implemented? Briefly, of course, in the interest of the paucity of the time, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, what went wrong, uh, um, let's say, very briefly, let's say there were some guidelines that uh, maybe were not implemented. The, the very, uh, the very, they were not updated on time, probably. See, I was not here exactly when the would this happen at a global, a global site level. Uh, what has been done? We uh, implemented the, the 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 new technology for what concern the uh, material management. Uh, uh, the quality, uh, the new quality uh, technologies, uh, and uh, the we started a long process for what concerned the, um, the 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 maintenance, the preventive maintenance. So we rebuilt uh, uh, many many facilities. So you know the guideline uh, keep changing continuously. So to get uh, out uh, out of the guideline is becoming pretty simple. So it's like uh, we need to keep updated uh, almost uh, monthly to, to not fall out of the guideline. So I think this is one of the main issues, uh, which is not only the pharma industry. I think uh, uh, we have to be to stay very much uh, uh, updated about the changes of the guideline. And when the guideline changes, we have to adapt very quickly to this on engineering quality and, and so on and so on. I think uh, this is more or less is what maybe went wrong. And this is what we need to be sure that remain uh, in the right path. Thank you, sir, and the best wishes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ritwik Shade from One Up Financial. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, sir, I have a few questions. Uh, firstly, uh, after the clearance received from uh, EDQM and the Japanese uh, regulatory agency. How has the inquiry uh, been at Baula and uh, have we seen better conversions? I know it's too early, but uh, can you give a sense of uh, how that has shaped up after we got the clearance? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Paolo, I think yeah. you should answer that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, uh, I have to say just uh, in less than two weeks, but uh, uh, we have seen, uh, as I mentioned in the previous call, uh, we have seen a very great enthusiasm already in the CTHI in Barcelona in October. And uh, of course, the customer needs to see, as I think almost everyone, to see the UGMP certification uploaded in the EUDRA, EUDRA GMP site in, in Europe. So in the last week, we received a lot of call. Uh, as I said, I mentioned also in the past the call, we were close to close two contracts. So now we are ready to sign the new contract for two uh, two projects, uh, which are all projects, but the contract was expired, and the uh, UGP certification was a key point to be able to sign this contract. Uh, we have seen, uh, yeah, many customers are approaching us um, from, uh, and uh, you know, they are approaching also for, for very interesting projects in the past. So we have seen, uh, as I said before, a great enthusiasm. Uh, just uh, it's just ten days, twelve days, but we see really. Uh, positive uh, building around the momentum. Hmm. Okay. And does this customer need to physically visit the site? Uh, yes. So basically, uh, the European 
uh, customer, they are obliged uh, basically to audit us, uh, mm-hmm. even though the DQM was here, so there is a kind of uh, regulation in Europe. Uh, but uh, many customers, they are also um, relying on uh, auditor uh, agencies. So agencies are coming here, they are auditing us, uh, and they are using the same uh, uh, the same report. But for example, last week we discussed with a customer which was uh, wanted a project uh, uh, very urgently, and uh, we shared the DQM report because it was the same product which was loaded by the DQM. They they think they can uh, uh, handle with this the uh, European authority. Okay. So yes, we are expecting a lot of audit from customers. Sure. Okay. And given this, uh, what kind of uh, revenue growth are we looking at for the India business for FI25 from the current uh, low base, uh, especially from the India crams uh, business? So uh, I think the India cram business should uh, should grow at a at a uh, you know at least in double digits, if not more. Uh, for I mean high double digits um, in the in the current or in the next financial year, and uh, uh, as far as the Naroda business is concerned, we do expect a good amount of growth in that particular business as well. So overall, I think India cramps. Uh, we are expecting that it should be closer to what we were doing pre DQM in the next financial year. Okay, so so. India cram should be potentially 300 to 350 crores in FI25. Would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, that, that, that's uh, that, that's a fair assessment. Okay, okay, thank you. And uh, so, second question is on uh, the employee cost. This quarter we have seen uh, a sharp jump uh, on a YO and uh, Q on Q basis. So, where does this employee cost settle? I know it's because uh, I, I think you've previously mentioned uh, because of the uh, Currency translation, but uh, so so where does this uh, settle around current 300, 310 crores quarterly run rate? Does it settle here or with this new French and uh, Swiss facility, this goes up further in FI25 from current base as well? So uh, you know this increase in the employee cost is uh, is largely driven by the FX movement. So if you just compare Q3 FY23 to Q3 FY24, mm. uh, the, the, there is an increase on account of FX uh, to the extent of about 24 crores. So that is just on account of translation. Mm. So while the total increase is 30 crores, of that 24 crores is just on account of the Swiss franc conversion into INR. Because last year, uh, the average exchange rate for the Swiss franc INR was uh, close to about 83, which uh, this year is about 93. So there is an increase of almost uh, what about 12 percent just on account of the translation. So uh, so what we expect is that going forward, uh, we don't see a major recruitment that should be happening at I would say globally for us. Uh, albeit for the, the FX movements, uh, you know, more or less we expect the employee cost should remain more or less at the same level. Okay. So, okay. And just uh, on this, if Indian uh, rupee appreciates against the Swiss franc, this can uh, reverse as well, right? Uh, keeping the same. Absolutely. But, I mean, historically that has not happened, but yeah. Yeah, you are, you are theoretical, right. but yeah. <laughs> okay. Got it. Got it. Okay, and uh, so another question was on the French facility. Uh, so you mentioned at the start that we are looking to do seven eight million uh, euros in Q4. Did I hear it right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, and for FI25, this number can be annualized twenty five thirty million dollars uh, euros. No, I think more conservative could be around twenty. Arshil? Yeah, I think about twenty million euros uh, for the next financial year. Is, is something which can be budgeted. Okay, and that is a, about a break even uh, at 20 million euros. Uh, well, it should be in excess of the break even is uh, is what we are expecting. Close to about 17 million, 17 to 18 million would be kind of the break even level. Okay. So yeah, I mean we, we should be a little bit in profit. Okay, and and where does this uh, reporting happen in the uh, segmental? Uh, does it come in the uh, Carbogen MX cramps? 
Yeah, so right now it is clubbed under Carbogen MCS CRAM. Right. Uh, from next year, you know, what we would be doing is uh, putting in a separate segment for the French facility because that's a, that's a different business. And as it becomes sizable, we will start showing those numbers separately. Sure, got it. So one last question from my end. So what is the gross debt and the interest cost and what is the split of the debt in terms of FX, uh, like Indian currency and uh, uh, Swiss franc and USD and Euro? If you can give that split, please. So, so our, our, our major debt is in Swiss franc. So I would say almost 95% uh, is in Swiss franc and that is the reason we report the uh, uh, the debt in Swiss francs, you know, when we give the, the, the presentation at the end of every quarter. Right. So right now, as of 31st of December, the net debt is about 158 million Swiss francs. Hmm. And um, the gross debt in INR is uh, roughly 2,105 2, crores. Okay, so gross debt is 2,105 crores and net debt is approximately 1,600 crores. Uh, yeah, so the net debt is one uh, one thousand five hundred and fifty eight crores. Okay. Okay, and yeah. what would be the average interest cost on uh, this? So the average interest cost is, uh, you know, right now it is close to about five uh, percent. Five percent. Yeah. Okay, sir. Uh, so thank you. Uh, that's it from my side and all the best. I think moderator, if uh, we can. Uh, if there are no further questions, or if there is a repetition, maybe we can take them again offline and uh, conclude the call with the last question. Uh, I think maybe there are just two two questions okay. remaining, so maybe we can just complete those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'll go ahead. We'll take the next question from the line of Nirvana Laha from Badrinath Family Office. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity again and keep this short. So, uh, Harshil, uh, the interest cost uh, this quarter, 33 crores, can we assume that this is the peak interest cost uh, that we'll see per quarter because we'll start deleveraging from here? Yeah, I would say so. Um, you know, 33 crores looks to be a, a fair assumption. Okay. I mean, unless and until something happens and the, and the LIBOR rates go up to 10% or something. Right. But uh, apart from that, yeah, this can be taken as the, as the peak. Sure, sure. And on employee cost, so, I mean, thanks for your explanation of the inflation of CHF and how much impact that has. But even if I normalize for that, I think you are at about 40% uh, kind of, you know, uh, to revenue uh, on employee cost. If I compare that with another CRAM CDMO player, which has factories uh, in, in the U.S., and also adjust for how much the INR has depreciated against the USD versus the CHF over the last 5-10 years, I think their costs are around 27%, whereas you are at 40%. So uh, I don't think that even for the currency adjusted to currencies that is uh, any in any way comparable. So what is your thought around this and is this figure going to come down as India scales up or what is the number we should update with say 2 years out? So I think as far as the employee cost is concerned, uh, and if you take um, entity-wise uh, P&L for us uh, at a group level, you know, the largest employee cost that we incur is in Switzerland. So almost uh, 50 to 55 percent of the of the P&L in uh, you know as far as the costs are concerned in Switzerland, you know that is the employee cost, and uh, uh, you know that is the kind of cost that we will have to incur in order to make sure that we are able to get more and more projects for development on the NCE side. I mean, what, what we sell is the, is, the, is the talent, is the technical capability that we have at the Swiss entity, and that attracts our customers the most. Uh, what we are trying to do is to try and see how we could reprice the projects uh, as, as far as the development work is concerned. But, you know, it would be very difficult for us to reduce that cost from what, um, you know, what the cost is currently. And uh, in a country, you know, where we are surrounded by the likes of Novartis, Roche, etc. I mean, we have to match the salaries where, which uh, which those guys are paying. And Switzerland, all said and done, is one of the 
one of the most costly, but from a quality perspective, one of the most stringent, one of the best, um, you know, that you can offer as far as the CDMO is concerned. So I think that is something that we will have to keep on incurring. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, close to about uh, 40%, maybe we can reduce it a little bit uh, as, as the revenues increase from India. Uh, because, you know, that, that is what I also mentioned earlier, that India would be the destination where we can actually bring in the cost efficiencies. And now also China, you know, because China, which earlier used to make losses, you know, now it is it has turned profitable for us. So these are the locations, you know, where we can actually bring in cost efficiencies. And as the revenues keep on increasing, uh, we would see the, the employee cost as a, as a percentage of revenue declining. And that would also be one of the factors in improving the EBITDA margins. Uh, for the group as a whole. Yeah, and Harshil, just to add, you know, uh, if you see the consolidated position, the raw material cost is hardly 20%. Uh, in Switzerland, 50% of the revenues are coming from developmental work, which is, you know, where the main input is the uh, human technical inputs. So we have a very strong uh, team of scientists, PhDs, etc., working. So there's a lot of um, intangible or soft skills involved. So therefore, you find this employee cost Historically, it has been high, and still we should be able to deliver a 20 to 25 percent EBITDA in a normalized situation. So I think it's we don't know which CDMO or CMO player you have compared uh, our numbers with, but this is what it is actually. So you know, I don't think everyone is directly comparable. So I mean, I'm happy to name it. It's Piramal Pharma. Uh, also, like from 2017 to 2019, I think you guys were doing 35, 37. Maybe percent. what we can do is we can take this offline once we also sure. analyze what you are talking about, and then I think Herschel can take care of your further requirements on this because we'll have to look at the model actually. Sure, sure. No, thank you so much. I appreciate yeah. the uh, the detailed answer. Thanks. All the best. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a last question from the line of Amish Sangvi from Anvil Research. Please go ahead. Yeah, th thank you for the opportunity. Uh, just uh, I would like to know what is the loss incurred at EBITDA level and uh, PBT level uh, for the French facility? Sure. So uh, for the French facility, just, just please. So for the French facility, uh, for the nine months, the the revenue was uh, 3.9 million and uh, the loss was 5.6 million uh, for the quarter the revenue was uh, 2.3 million and uh, the loss at an ebitda level was 1.4 million okay thank you very much thank so, you thank you I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Pascal for closing comments. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, moderator, and thank you very much, uh, dear shareholder, for attending this uh, uh, <coughs> sessions of, of, of report. I hope that we have answered all the, your questions, and uh, as uh, Sanjay mentioned, if there is further details, uh, we can address that offline. I thank you very much, and I wish you a good evening. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. On behalf of Dishman Carpet and Amsys Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.